Heather this morning. So good to see all of you who are here today. And great to be seen by all of you who are watching on Facebook Live. And great to be seen by all of you who are going to be watching later on YouTube. Uh, it is good to be together in all the various ways that the Lord assembles us. And our opening scripture today is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 27. Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 27. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. We are here because of you. You awakened us, you invited us, you put it in our hearts to get here, to tune in, uh, to look for you. And we pray that as we come together today in our various modes, that you would dwell in our midst, and that you would minister to each and every one of us, and that you would minister through us, and that you would have your way. Accomplish your good and perfect will in our hearts and our lives today, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.
it ring in Zion. Let us rejoice and bless the Lord. Clap, clap, come on. Clap, clap your hands. All you people, shout, shout for joy to the Lord. Oh, sing, sing a new song. Let it ring in Zion. Let us rejoice and bless the Lord. Let us rejoice. Come on. Let us rejoice and bless the Lord. Let us rejoice and bless the Lord. Clap, clap your hands. Amen. Thank you, Brother Eddie. We want to go to the Lord in prayer at this time, and so would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, that is the cry of our hearts, that you would make us your sanctuary. We pray that for each of us individually, and that you would dwell within our lives, dwell within our hearts, to where we are completely transformed by your presence through Christ Jesus. Uh, we pray that you would help us to live holy lives that are pure, that our motives would be your love. And we pray that your love would so fill our hearts, be so shed abroad within us, that everything that we do would be compelled by your great love for us in Christ Jesus. Help us to love those not simply who love us, but help us to love those that it's difficult to love. Help us to love those who do us wrong, who speak ill of us. Uh, Lord, we, we, we don't have the power to love like that on our own, but we pray that we'd be so gripped by your love that we would find ourselves loving the most difficult of people in our lives. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to live truly surrendered to you as Jesus calls us to, that we would be so moved by your love for us in Christ that we would answer that call and that we would put following Jesus first and foremost in our lives and that we would surrender dreams and ambitions, that we would surrender goals, that we would sur surrender past hurts, that we would surrender failures, that we would just live utterly surrendered to you because of your great love for us. Lord, as we pray this for ourselves individually, 
We pray it for each other and we pray it for your church. Help us to be a people, Lord, that loves each other because we've been so loved by you. Help us to be a people, Lord, that that lives with you first because of your great love. Again, Lord, we can't do this on our own, but through your spirit, we can grow in our knowledge, our comprehension of your great love for us. And we just pray you would transform us so that we are especially identified as a loving people. Lord, we live in a world that is so desperate for love, uh, desperate beyond measure. And we pray, Lord, that as the world goes after so many things looking for love, that they would recognize just the faithfulness of you and your church and that the world would see that if, if they want love, that you and your people are the place to come. And we pray, Lord, that you would prepare us to be receptive, prepare us to be loving, help us to be able to speak, help us to be able to speak the truth in love. And we pray that you would be glorified. Pray this not only for us on this corner, but across the street, up the street, downtown, all parts of the globe. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to be a people that is compelled by your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it is great to have all of you here today and great to uh, have you watching online. I forgot to pray for Pastor D. Uh, Pastor D is up in San Bernardino preaching today at the Church of the Nazarene there. And so bow your heads once again. Father in heaven, we do ask you to be with Pastor D today and that you would strengthen him, empower him, embolden him uh, to proclaim the word that you have placed upon his heart today and give him traveling mercies. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Okay, well, I have a question for you. It's really kind of a two-part question. And the question is this. Maybe it's not a question as much as a command. So first thing I want you to do is, in about a minute, name off all the parts of a car that you can think of. Okay, and so talk to someone where you're at. If you're at home by yourself, just talk out loud. But name off as many parts of a car as you can. Okay, go for it. Okay, lest I be accused of asking a biased question, uh, part two, name off the ingredients of a chocolate chip cookie. Okay, the best answer I heard for chocolate chip cookies was the dough and the chocolate chips. Uh, that sounds like it'll work to me. Now, next thing. What is the job of the mechanic? What is the job of the baker? Okay, if, if only you were here to hear all of these good answers. Our passage this morning is found in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. This is the, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church or the house churches uh, in the city of Ephesus. So Ephesians chapter 4, and starting at verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he 
who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your word this morning. Thank you for your presence with us, your ministry to us already. And we pray that as we turn our attention to your word, as we come before you, that you would speak afresh to us and give us ears to hear you, hearts to be open and receptive to you, minds to be willing and obedient to you. We pray, Father, that you would have your way in our midst. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So let me just remind you quickly of the Ephesus context. We know that Paul started this church, and we read about this in Acts chapter 19. And he was there for about three years, and then he moved on. And it's been seven years since he was at this church. And where he's at now is in Rome under house arrest. And he's been in prison one form or another for the past few years. And so he writes this letter from Rome under house arrest, and he's very concerned about the churches in Ephesus. Some of the people there know him. Some of the people there have only heard about him. But he still feels this kind of pastoral responsibility for how they are doing. And so he writes to encourage them. He writes to strengthen them. He writes to help them grow and to become who God saved them to be, who God created them to be. Now, the people living in Ephesus... They have a lot of, what, cultural stuff to deal with? And so Ephesus was a city where magic was practiced. And so most of the people in the church, at some point, they had had been involved in magic at some level. It was just what was in the air. It was the culture of Ephesus. And the beliefs were that you had all of these various spiritual powers that were out there, and you needed to use magic to control them and to try to make sure that you could manage life well, manage these powers well, or they would do you in. It was also the city where the temple to Artemis was. And this was a magnificent temple, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And Artemis was this god that was seen as being super powerful and would watch over your life, bless you with fertility, provide for you. But you had to make sure that you honored her and that you worshiped her. And so it was it was common practice for the households in Ephesus to have a shrine within their own home to the goddess Artemis. She was so important to that culture, to those people. And then the the third thing that they dealt with was worship of the emperor, that the Roman emperor had authority over the territory of Ephesus. And the Roman emperor was seen as kind of the lord of history and the one who was bringing history into this golden age. And so you would, you would worship the emperor, you would worship Artemis, you would practice magic to try to control the spirits and the powers that are out there. You had to keep all these quote-unquote deities happy and pleased with you, or they would undo your life and everything would unravel. And you can just imagine some of the fear that people would live in. And into this culture, Paul came announcing the good news of Jesus Christ, that Christ is, is, was given to us by God, died for our sins. We were reconciled and was raised from the grave. And in Christ, we have victory. In Christ, we have victory, liberation from the power of sin. That in Christ, we have the hope of the resurrection, that we don't need to fear death, that Christ reigns supreme over every power. And so you don't need to worry about controlling the powers. Christ has all that. That all we need to do is grow in our relationship with Christ. And Christ will take care of the rest. Doesn't mean there won't be challenges. Doesn't mean there won't be trouble. Doesn't mean there won't be things that go wrong. 
uh, that are difficult to deal with, but Christ has it. That he's got all power and he's loving and God is at work in and through Christ on our behalf. And so Paul writes to strengthen them in this. And so he, he writes this and one of the metaphors that he has used, which is very fitting and also very fascinating, is that he has compared the church to a temple. And in fact, it's a growing temple. And he's kind of mixed two metaphors together because buildings don't grow. Okay, you build your building and maybe you do a, an add-on or something, and in that sense it grows. But he uses the word growing like you would use of a person who is growing, of a child who is growing. My, how you've grown. Okay, and of someone who is maturing, not just in age, but also in character. And so, so he, he mixes these two metaphors together of building a temple and a growing person. And so you have this kind of growing body of people that are God's building project right there in Ephesus. You have a worship center for the emperor. You have a huge temple to Artemis. And guess what? There is a new building project in town that there is a new temple that is going up. But it's not a building. It's people. It's the people that Jesus has saved. It's the people that Jesus has called. It's the people that are growing in their knowledge of what God has done for them in Christ Jesus. And they continue to grow. Grow in terms of more people joining them. Like, wow, I see what God is doing in your life. How do I become part of that? I see that you're no longer practicing magic and living in fear of these powers that are out there. I see you living in freedom and actually showing love. Like, how can I get some of that? How do I become part of that? And so the church growing in number so that you got more and more house churches that are springing up, but also the church growing in maturity so that they become more and more like Christ. And so God has begun through Paul and the work of the Spirit, this, this new building project, this temple project within Ephesus. And Paul knows that since he's been gone, it's continuing to grow. The Spirit didn't quit working just because he was called and compelled to move on. And so the church is growing, but he writes to encourage them that they would keep on growing. And he reminds them that all power belongs to Jesus. He reminds them that the love of Jesus is all-surpassing. And that through Jesus and through the work of the Spirit, through various people, that God is building this new temple. Chapter 4. We looked at this last week. He calls for them to live a life worthy of this calling. To walk a life worthy of this calling. That God has chosen you, called you to be part of this new temple building project, this new humanity where Jesus is our peace. And to live a life worthy means that you're going to walk in humility instead of arrogance. It means that you're going to practice gentleness instead of bullying your way around. It means that you're going to be patient with other people instead of impatient and demanding your way. That's what a worthy life looks like. And that we're going to bear with each other in love. That we're not going to simply put up with each other, but we're actually going to lovingly put up with each other. And that we are going to be eager to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That that's what a worthy life looks like, a worthy walk looks like. And he reminds us of the unity that we have, that there is that there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father over all. So he reminds them of this unity, and you can see that walking worthy, walking in humility, walking patiently with one another, walking gently with each other, bearing with each other in love, that that's going to bring about unity. But he keeps working on this unity issue. And it's kind of like, how? How is unity going to come about? We see the character aspects of it. 
in terms of the humility and the gentleness and the patience, but what else is involved in terms of becoming a people that is unified, a people that is one, a people that is mature in Christ? And so he goes on to answer that in our, in our passage today. So look at verse 7. Might be the key verse to the whole thing. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And then look all the way down with me to verse 16. From him, Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Okay, now did you see that? The beginning of verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And then you go down to the end of this section, verse 16, and the body, the church, builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Okay, so the, the first thing I want us to make sure that we pick up on is that Christ gave gifts as Christ saw fit to each and every believer, to each and every person that is a member of the church, that is a believer in Christ Jesus, God has given grace. And that grace isn't just so that you'll get to heaven. That grace isn't just so that you know that you're forgiven. That grace isn't just so that you can be victorious over sinful habits. That grace is also for the purpose of building up the body, building up the church. So how is the church going to mature? How is this temple going to get built, so to speak? It's going to get built because Christ has apportioned grace to each and every member, each and every believer, that there is no person here who is graceless. There is no person here who is giftless. That everybody has been, been given gifts. Everybody has been given grace for the upbuilding of the church. And as we learn to use our gifts and graces that God has given us for the edifying, for the building up of each other, what we discover is that the, the, that the, the temple, the building, the body, the people, become mature in Christ together. And there is a greater and growing unity in the love of Christ. Don't know that you've ever had this experience. I hope you haven't. But just imagine on a Christmas morning and everybody is there gathered and presents are being opened and there's no gift for you. And it's like everybody else has their gift, but there's no gift for you. Don't know why. Maybe you were bad that year, but no gift for you. I got to tell you, that's not the church. That's not Christ. That Christ has a gift for everyone. And it's not just a gift for you so that you can go off in the corner and play with your gift while everybody else is out playing with their gifts. Christ's gift to you, for you, is a gift to the church and for the church. Okay, again, let me just, let me just read Paul again. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. To each and every believer, Christ has given grace, he's given gifts, and the purpose of those gifts is for the upbuilding of the church, upbuilding of this new temple project, upbuilding of this new body of people in Christ Jesus. And so if you look down to the very end, from him, Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We will never be who God saved us to be, called us to be, 
graced us to be unless you do your part, unless you do your work, unless you take the gift that Christ has given you and you begin to use it to build up others. Okay, that's, that's how unity is going to come about. And then Paul is going to get more specific as we kind of go through the middle part of this passage. And so if you take a look with me at verses 8 through 10, the theme here is how is it that Christ is able to give such gifts? Okay, and so here it is in kind of a, a nutshell. And this is kind of Paul working with Psalm 68, verse 18. But it goes like this. Verse 8, this is why it says, and if you're wondering what the it is at Psalm 68, 18, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. Okay, who's the he? Christ. Christ ascended on high, and Christ was victorious and took captive uh, all the powers of the world. And so as the one who reigns on high, seated above all the powers at the right hand of God, he has gifts to give, and he graciously gives them. Verse 9, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles and prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers. So the point is, that Christ is victorious. And there is no area where Christ lost. His victory is complete. And so when it talks about how he, he ascended is the one who descended, all it's calling attention to is that there's nothing in heaven, nothing on earth, nothing below earth, in kind of the realm of the dead. There's no place where Christ comes up short on victory. His victory is complete. Okay, and that's why Paul says in his letter to the church at Philippi that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth that Christ is Lord, that Christ reigns. And so this ascending and descending is trying to call attention. Paul's emphasizing that there's no part of, of reality where Christ is not victorious. He reigns. And because he reigns, he is in the position to give gifts. And so he graciously starts giving gifts to his people so that we can be this temple, we can be this new humanity, this building project that demonstrates the true and the full victory of Christ Jesus. And so look with me at verse 11. And here Paul singles out five groups, if you will, of, of giftedness, or five areas, five ways in which Christ gifted people, or you might even say five offices. Okay, so five offices where Christ has gifted people for particular work. Now, what are they? It was Christ who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. And who is he giving these to? He's giving them to the church. Okay, so I got to get this really clear. The gift is... How should I say it? Okay, so, so he gives the gift of apostleship. But then what Christ does is he gives the apostles to the church. Okay, are you with me on that? He gives the gift of prophecy, but he gives the prophets to the church. He gives the gift of evangelism to people, but then he gives the evangelist to the church. He gives a gift of pastoring to people, of shepherding to people, to particular people. But then he gives those people, those pastors, to the church. He gives a gift of teaching to people. And then he gives those teachers to the church so that the church can be built up. So what Paul's thinking about here 
is not simply that some people have the gift of evangelism, some people have the gift of teaching, some people have the gift of pastoring, some people have the gift of prophecy. No, what he's getting at here is not simply that people have these gifts, but that these people with these gifts are actually given to the church. Okay, are, are you with me? Are you tracking with me? So, for example, Pastor D is gifted, and we see his giftedness in terms of his ability to teach, his ability to preach, his ability to shepherd people, to care for people. So we see that, that Pastor D is a gift from Christ to us. It's not simply that Pastor D is gifted. Rather, we're gifted with Pastor D. Okay, are, are you tracking with me? We don't normally take that second step. Then normally we think, oh, that person is really gifted. Oh, that person is really blessed. Like God has really given them a gift for the word. Or God has really given them a gift to pray over people and to prophesy and to speak a word into their life. And, and we think about how people are gifted. But do you realize that God gifts these people and then gives them to the church? So we have been gifted. We have been graced with Pastor D. He is a gift to us from Christ. Today, today, Christ decided to give Pastor D to the church up in San Bernardino for a morning and for next Sunday morning as well. So they're Christ's gifts to give to the church as Christ sees fit, as Christ measures out. And so we're experiencing that today in terms of, well, Christ decided that today, this Sunday, going to give Pastor D as a gift to the San Bernardino First Church of the Nazarene. But just for the morning, I want him back. Okay, but, but just realize that that's kind of how Paul's thinking here, that not simply that people have different gifts, but that God gives people these gifts. He gifts them and then gives them to the church body. And they have a role to play in the church body exercising those gifts. Now, we got five named off here. We have apostles, we have prophets, we have evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, probably, as Paul is using the word apostles here, kind of a technical term for those who for those who were in contact in some kind of way with, with Jesus. I mean, how should I say it? The historical Jesus? Okay, that they saw Jesus in the flesh. Let me put it that way. Okay, so we're talking about guys like Peter and John, uh, James, not just James the disciple, but James the brother of Jesus, eyewitness. Paul counts himself as the least of the apostles because his encounter with Jesus was rather brief. It was the resurrected Jesus that met him on the Damascus Road. So he didn't have as much, quote unquote, face time with Jesus as the others. And so he considered himself the least. But apostles is probably kind of a technical category here of those who had face time with Jesus in the flesh. And Paul says, this is really a special privilege, okay? It's a gift, but it's not so that you can brag about it. Rather, Christ then gives you to the church. And you have a role to play in terms of bearing witness to Jesus, to his ministry, to his death, to his resurrection. So in a, in a looser way, less technical sense apostle basically means someone who is sent kind of like an ambassador someone that is sent to represent someone else but in this technical sense you're sent directly by jesus that you had a face to face face to face with jesus and jesus is sending you so the apostles that's why he always lists them first now prophets Prophets, what he's talking about here, not your Old Testament prophets, but he's talking about people that have been gifted by Christ with the Holy Spirit to be able to, to, be able to speak into people's lives. 
And they might do this individually to where Christ has given them a word, you know, for this person and for this person, for this brother, for this sister. And, and some of you have experienced that in terms of being the prophet, where God has given you a word for somebody going through a particular crisis. And it's like God just gave it to you and you speak it and it's like a word of life for them. And some of you have received those kind of words for, from people to where God gave somebody a word for you. And they spoke that word over you and into your life. And all of a sudden, it was like this life-giving word. And so, so there are those who have the gift of prophecy, prophets. And they are going to be able to kind of speak God's will into and over your life. And individually and collectively. So a prophet might have a word for a congregation, a word for a people. And that word moves the church, and God uses that word to grow the church, to set the church on course. And sometimes these words might break and before they actually build up. We see that all through the Old Testament prophets. So we got the apostles who have had face-to-face time with Jesus, and now they're commissioned to go and announce the good news of, of the death and resurrection of Jesus. We have prophets who have been sent to reveal God's word to people. Uh, God's will to people for their lives and for congregations. And then we have evangelists. And evangelists kind of continue, if you will, the work of the apostles in terms of typically going. But they didn't have the face-to-face with Jesus. Um, That's just the apostles. But the evangelists are, are sent with good news. And they typically travel so that they might be in this town or this location for a while, and they have this ability to share the good news about Jesus. And it might be that they go from person to person. Maybe it's not so much geographical traveling as it is kind of going from person to person. And so they'll talk to these people at work and these people at work. Somebody new moves into the neighborhood. The evangelist is going to meet them. So the evangelist is always going to somebody with good news. Okay, and again, I, I, I got to emphasize this. The evangelist is not constantly, quote unquote, soul winning. So that the evangelist can kind of show a scorecard like this is how many people I won to Christ. How about you? Okay, that would be totally self-focused. Okay, the evangelist is someone who has been given to the church for the upbuilding of the church. So the evangelist doesn't go door to door or go uh, country to country trying to quote unquote win people. So look what I've done. No, it's all in service to the church so that the church can grow, so that the body of Christ can grow and become more mature and more complete. And so the church has been given apostles, has been given prophets, has been given evangelists, and now pastors and teachers. And the idea behind a pastor is one who is a shepherd. And so that means you're going to be providing leadership and care for people, just as a shepherd does for sheep. And, and sometimes shepherd was even used of, of political leaders, government leaders, that the leader is not simply to use that power for themselves. The leader is to use that power and care of the flock, all those that are under their leadership. And so Paul is saying some have been given this gift of pastoring, And those pastors are given to congregations to shepherd them, to care for them. And so that the pastors are gifts to the churches. One of our former district superintendents, John Denny, he loved this passage. And he had always emphasized that pastors are gifts to their church. Now, He did not encourage us to go around with this attitude. Like, hey, I'm God's gift to you. You know, I mean, that's kind of getting a little bit arrogant about it. But at the same time, there's some truth to that. That pastors are God's gifts to the church, to the body. And and so I want us to, to hold on to that that all of these offices, they're not for the sake of the person who has the gifts. They're for the sake of 
the body. And so last night we had an ordination service on the district and we had six people get ordained. It was outdoors up in Escondido and we only had, you know, you could only have 100 people in attendance because of the COVID restrictions. And so each one got to invite, you know, 10 of their family members, friends, whatever. So we had about 100 people there. And so they were ordained. Okay, but you know that that ordination wasn't all about simply their calling. And like now they have the churches and tr the church entrusting them with authority. No, what's going on there is that they're now, quote unquote, recognized at a deeper level that, hey, you have been gifted and you have been working to grow in your giftedness and in your calling. And you are God's gifts to the church, to pastor, to serve. The last one here is teach. So pastors and teachers. Teachers do less administrative work. The focus here on the teachers is that they're going to teach the word of God, that they're going to teach correct doctrine, that they're going to teach faithful living. So not so much in terms of what we might think of as administra administrating various ministries and providing leadership at that level, as much as kind of the, the teaching level of, no, this is the gospel. And this is what faithful living looks like. And this is what faithful believing looks like. And so God has called these, gifted these, and given these to the church. And, and I, I just want to say a couple more things on this. That, that all of these, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, that they are called not to get, they are called to be given. Let me say it again. Called not to get, but called to be given. See, sometimes we can approach it that I'm called, and so it's all about getting a church. And then it's about getting a bigger church or getting this ministry position. I'm called, and then I try to get. But, but that's not it. Because Christ doesn't call us to get. Christ calls us and then gives us. So we are called to be given. Brother Dan's parents just retired from being missionaries. How many years, Dan? So like 30, 34 years, something like that. And, and so, so I knew that so quick because we got married in 87. So, so, so called to be missionaries and it wasn't about getting this assignment or getting that assignment or getting to have this authority or power in the church. It was called and given, and given to different parts of the world, given to different peoples, given to different assignments, given to different tasks. See, we are called to be given. And I just cannot emphasize that enough, that Christ calls us in order to give us. And so you may be you may be thinking about your gifts today. You may be thinking about your calling today. And you may be trying to sort that out and and the Lord will guide you in sorting it out, but know this for sure that he has called you in order to give you to somebody, to something, to some ministry. He has called you in order to in order to use you to benefit to build up the body of Christ. So he, the, we have a given purpose. We are given to prepare God's people for works of service and ministry. Look with me at verse 12. So why does he call some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers? Verse 12, why? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now look at verse 12 again. These folks are called to prepare God's people for what? For works of service. Now, 
I find it fascinating that he doesn't say these people are called the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. He doesn't say that they're called to do what? Works of service. He says, no, they are called to prepare who? God's people for works of service. Okay, I hope you're getting this. I know that you I know that you do just from the way you live and your practice, but I, I want us to make sure that it's spelled out. That the vision here is not that the pastors and the teachers and the evangelists and the apostles and the prophets, the vision is not that they do all the work. The vision is not that they do all the ministry, that they do all the serving. Rather, Paul is saying that God has called these people and given them to the church and their work in the church is to prepare the church for works of service, for works of ministry. Are, 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 are we seeing that? That it's not about we hire a pastor and it becomes a pastor's job to do all the ministry. That, that's completely wrong. If I understand what Paul's saying here, that no, we pray and God gives us a pastor as a gift and that pastor will help us grow us into maturity to where we do ministry, to where we serve. Listen to it again. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And so the work of the pastor, the work of the teacher, the work of the evangelist, the work of the prophet, the work of the apostle is to prepare the people of God for works of service. That these five categories of people, they don't do all the work themselves. These five offices, they don't do all the ministry. Rather, they prepare the people of the church to do works of ministry, to do works of service. And then as they do those works of service, what's the goal? So that the body of Christ may be built up. Not so that I become popular. Not so that everybody recognizes how, how gifted I am. Not so that I become the most important and influential person in the church. No. It's so that through me doing the services that I've been prepared to do, now the body is growing and becoming healthier. Whether that means expanding with new people coming in or whether that means going from immature Christians to mature Christians, to lives being transformed. And so, the, so that the body of Christ may be built up, verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Wow. See, that's the goal that I and Pastor D would be used of God to equip you for works of ministry. And those works of ministry, they might happen on this corner. But most likely, they're going to happen where you live. Most likely, they're going to happen where you work. Most likely, they're going to happen with people that you interact with. And in doing that, you're going to help people grow. You're going to help people come to know Christ. And some of you are going to, once somebody, somebody brings somebody to church and and they become a believer, and then there might be somebody else here who comes alongside that person and begins to help them grow and help them to mature in Christ and begins to pray for them and encourage them and strengthen them. And so I, I hope you can kind of see how this works, that Paul is all about not simply what the pastor and the teacher and the prophet and the evangelist are supposed to be doing. He's saying, look, they've just been given to church after church after church to help the members of the church, the believers in Christ, to grow and to equip them for their works of service. And that as the members do their works of service, guess what? The body grows stronger. 
and healthier. And more people come to know, more people experience, and more people become mature. It's a growing process towards maturity, and that maturity is going to look like a unity in the faith that we're not going to have this person over here believing this and this person over here believing that and this person back here believing that and it's kind of like well whatever you want to believe it's all good no that's not unity in the faith and especially if we look on you know you might think unity in the faith in terms of well we all trust god so we're uni united in the faith well true but look at verse 14 then we will no longer be infants immature tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Unity in the faith is not simply that we're all united and trusting and then we can do whatever we want to do as if nothing is actually true. Unity in the faith means that we've kind of arrived, matured to where we're united in what we believe. That... Jesus died for all sin and that salvation is available to all and that because of what God has done in our lives through Christ Jesus and now we're dead to sin and alive to Christ that calls for a particular ethic and so all those who were ordained last night part of what they had to agree to they had to be united with the church of the Nazarene in our doctrine and united with the Church of the Nazarene in our covenants of Christian character and Christian conduct. See, that, that maturity of being built together to where we are one in faith, not just saying, I trust Jesus and you trust Jesus and we can go live however we want to live. That's not really being united in, in, in our faith. So, so that's something that will happen as we build each other up. Second part of it, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Knowledge in the Son of God, now we're talking personal relationship. Now we're talking this kind of knowing Jesus so well that we find ourselves being transformed by him, becoming more and more like him. And so we are united in the faith we have the correct doctrine, but we also have this growing knowledge of the Son of God so that we become truer and truer reflections of who Jesus is in our living, in our attitudes, in our hearts, so that we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. As I think about that, if we're going to become mature like that, Christ has to have all of us. Has to have all of us. Otherwise, we will never reach maturity. If he doesn't have all of us, we'll never be filled by all of him. To have all of us, there's two ways this, this all goes. So the first way, he has to have all of me. Can't just have a portion of me. Can't just have me on Sunday mornings can't just have the things in my life that are easy to give to him while I hold on to other things. He has to have all of me if I'm going to be filled to the full measure of him, of his presence in my life. And until he has all of me, then I won't be a very, what, good upbuilder of the body that Christ won't be able to do everything through me that he wants to do. I'll be kind of like, well, I don't know what the right way to say it is. I'll be a disappointing gift. Put it that way. If, if he gives me to the church, but he doesn't have all of me, that's going to be just kind of disappointing. That he won't be able to do everything in me and through me that he desires to do and that the body needs me to do it. So he's got to have all of me. But he also has to have all of us. If we are going to be a people that grows into the full measure of what Christ wants to do in us and through us, 
He's got to have all of us. It can't just be that he has all of the pastor. It can't just be that he has all of Brother Eddie and, and his, his gift of music and leading and worship that, that he gives us, that Christ gives us. He's got to have all of us, whatever our role here is. And that it's only as he has all of us that we grow into this maturity where we attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And you can see verses 14 through 17, the contrast. We will no longer be infants. Infants not in terms of innocency, but infants in terms of not being fully developed. Infants in terms of kind of immaturity. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead of being infants, we will speak the truth in love. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. For from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Speaking the truth in love. We do this to build each other up. So you can speak truth, but if there's no love in that truth, that truth is just going to tear down. That truth is just going to discourage. That truth is just going to break people, cause people to get defensive, cause people to get bitter. If you just speak the truth, but you got no love, you may have some really powerful things to say, but most likely you're just going to drive people away and tear them down. And some people so react against speaking the truth in love or speaking truth that they just want to speak love. But it's really not a good definition of love because never confront you on anything. Just kind of lovingly affirm you in everything that you're doing, everything that you're believing, whether it's true or not, everything that you're doing, whether it's healthy or not, whether it's building the church up or not. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be a loving people, and so we're just going to affirm you and affirm everything and affirm everybody. Okay, but, but that's not really love. Okay, like if you got a neighbor, and they're in their house, and you see fire coming and smoke coming from out the back, but, you know, you don't want to make them feel bad, and so you just, you know, you got a really nice house. It's absolutely beautiful. Meanwhile, there's a fire that's burning. But you don't want to confront them on it because that's kind of insulting. Hey, something's wrong with your house. Well, who are you to say something's wrong with my house? Meanwhile, what's happening to the house? Burning down. Maybe what needed to happen was some truth spoken in the middle of that love so that there's a lovingly concern. And see, if you really love, you're going to speak truth. But you're going to speak that truth out of a context, out of a heart of love, and you're going to make sure that the relationship is st so strong that people know that you love them and that you care for them. And you're actually concerned for their well-being, that you're not just trying to steamroll them with truth. Paul's saying this is how the church is going to grow, how the church is going to get healthy. You might even put it this way, that as we tenderly put up with each other and call each other out in love, then we will begin to mature. Then we will grow. Then we will build each other up. And all of this is done under the lordship of Christ Jesus. So that when I speak the truth in love, I have to measure myself against that truth before I go speak it. And then when I speak the truth in love, I'm not about blasting somebody with truth. I'm about building somebody up in love. And that that truth is necessary if they're going to mature and truly be built up. And then I see that all of this impacts the whole body, impacts this new temple. From him, Christ Jesus, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up 
in love as each part does its work. I don't know about you, but that is a challenge. But by the grace, by the power of God, and by the gifting of Christ Jesus, gifting us to be given, it's going to happen that we will be a temple. We will be the body of people in which Christ dwells. And we will know the measure of his fullness. And the people that interact with us, the people that pass by and get to know us, you know what their comment will be? I think God lives there. Isn't that the corner that God lives on? You know, where is God at in this neighborhood? Man, I hope people can say 3605 National. I hope they can also say across the street at 3602 National. And downtown on 16th and Market. And up on 43rd where Victory Outreach is. I hope that all of us together, you know, are are recognizing and, and that the Spirit is fulfilling exactly what Paul is talking about here. That he has given each and every one of us gifts and graces to be given to the body so that the body can become mature and that becomes this temple that is marked by the fullness of God dwelling in our midst so that everybody knows if I want to meet God, I just got to go there. If I'm, in, if, I'm, if I'm with those people, I know that I'm in the presence of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, help us. You have indeed called us, chosen us. And you have graced us with gifts. Sometimes we get stuck and we feel like everybody else has the gifts, but somehow we got overlooked and didn't get anything. Lord, would you open our eyes? Would you help us to see that you have gifted each and every one of us? And that you have given us a gift for the upbuilding of the church, the upbuilding of your people? that you haven't given us gifts to just go use by ourselves and make a name for ourselves with or hide away with, but that you have given us gifts to be used for the upbuilding of this body, your people, your church on this corner. And we pray that you would help us to use those gifts in a way that's faithful and true to you. And we pray, Lord, that you would have all of us individually, that you would have all of me that you would have all of each one who is here, all of each one who is tuned in, that you would have us all, and that you would have all of us together, that there'd be no one of us holding back. And then, Lord, having all of us, we pray that you would empower us with your spirit, that you would help us to do our part. And sometimes we're confused about what our part might be, Lord, open our eyes. Help us to see the part you want us to play. Help us not to get concerned whether it's a big part or a little part. Lord, just help us to do our part. And we pray, Father, that in doing our part, we would find deep satisfaction and deep joy. And we would be able to see that you're using us and our part, whatever it might be, for the health, the upbuilding of your people, that everybody might recognize that you reside amongst us. Lord, have your way and make us one in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, I invite you to sing Amazing Grace with me. Brother Eddie's going to come as well. And uh, it's only through grace that we become this new building project, this new temple, and that we grow to maturity. So would you stand and would you join? 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. But now I see. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Use your gift, give it well, and be built well. God bless. Get it all? Is it still going? <laughs>